Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of the Gospel Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Kreps, and today is another Tuesday takeaway where we aim to bring God's Word into our week. And this is the last unit of Romans chapter 8. I just concluded preaching 15 sermons on this one chapter, and as I preached this text last Sunday, I felt a certain sadness over moving forward in the book of Romans. Uh, if, if you're interested in any of those sermons, you can check them out at livinghopechurchpa.com. Well, this episode is called, God Will Love Us Forever, which is an incredible statement to be able to make, but it is a true statement that flows out of Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39, and that's what we will explore on this episode. So let's get right into it after this. Hope your week is getting off to a good start. Uh, Mine is. Uh, Kate and I enjoyed time with uh, the other pastors on my team and their families yesterday as we had them over for a cookout, an evening, with not just fellow pastors and their wives, but truly with friends. And we got the fire pit going, s'mores around the fire while we laughed and enjoyed each other's company. Uh, Today, I'm very grateful for God's good gift of friendship, but I'm even more grateful for God giving us his word, which we will now have the privilege of looking at together. So I'm going to read Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39, this last unit in the book of Romans chapter 8. And as I prepare to read, let me say, this is the word of God. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I have to say, wow. I've spent a lot of time in this text, but it is such a beautiful text. And clearly, when you read this text, you see that God aims to convince every Christian, every one of us that has trusted Christ, that he loves us and that he will never stop loving us. The love of God is not a sort of sentimental, nice, cute little thing. Uh, The love of God revealed in and through Holy Scripture is overwhelmingly comprehensive and active toward us in blessing us. I think one way to distill these verses down into a short sentence would be to say that these verses inform us that God will love us forever for every person who has entrusted themselves to the risen Christ of the cross, this can be highly personalized. 
God will love me forever. We see in verse 31 that God fights for us. We have real enemies, and those enemies, the world, Satan, even our own sin, can cause us pain and sorrow, but ultimately, no weapon formed against us can prosper, for God is on our side. Uh, Verse 32 assures us that in God's love for us, he will provide for us. When God aims to convince us how generous he is toward us in his love, he directs our attention to the cross, for it is there that we see the Father not sparing the Son, but rather giving him up for us all to bear our sin and judgment as our substitute. And that inexpressibly great demonstration of generosity is the foundation for us to trust God God, with Christ, will graciously give us all that we need to persevere with joy throughout the whole of our lives until we enter into our inheritance in the presence of Christ. In verses 33 and 34, we are told that in his love, God justifies us. No charge of guilt can be brought against our souls that can finally stand, for God justifies his elect. He declares us not guilty, forgiven, and right through Jesus Christ uh, for each that he chooses to receive his grace. And furthermore, there can be no condemnation before God for justified sinners because Christ has died for our sins and more was raised for our justification. And he's alive at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. The wounds of his cross pleading on our behalf before the throne. As the hymn writer says, forgive them, oh forgive, they cry. Don't let that ransom sinner die. And if God does not condemn us, well, then nobody else can in any way that will alter our glorious future. That's what his love looks like. I love Isaiah 50, verses 8 and 9, the confident declaration of the truth of what we read in Romans 8, where Isaiah says, He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The answer is no one. In verses 35 through 39, these glorious verses, we find that in love, God has totally committed himself to us, and nothing in all the universe can interfere with that love or separate us from the love of Christ. Even in the most terrible moments of our lives, God is there, working all things together for our good, loving us, sustaining us by his grace. That means if you get cancer, he is still loving you. If he heals the cancer, he is loving you. If he withholds that healing in his divine wisdom, he still is loving you. There's no moment of your life, even when you sin, that God is not loving you. There's not one moment where God is not loving his blood-bought, justified trophies of his grace. And so we are more than conquerors in Christ. Yeah, I don't feel like a conqueror, you may think. My daily experience is not one of moving from one conquering victory to the next, but we read in these verses that it is in Christ we are more than conquerors, not in and of ourselves. And so the hymn writer says, Let me no more my comfort draw from my frail grasp of thee. In this alone rejoice with all thy mighty grasp of me. So this revelation of the love of God here in Romans 8 should give us peace and rest in suffering. It should produce in us joy in our trials. Well, 
Now maybe you're thinking, well, if God has set his love on me, and he's not going to take it away, then I guess I can do whatever I want with my life, right? I mean, why not even sin so that grace abounds all the more? What's the problem if God will love me forever? Well, that's just not what people who know the love of God talk like. The person who views God's love in this way doesn't understand the effect and fruit of the love of God. The unfailing, unchangeable love of God is not like a sort of free pass to live however we like, to pursue sin without fear and so forth. When a guilty sinner truly experiences the love of God in Christ, there is a transforming effect by the Holy Spirit, so much so that with the Apostle Paul, as he says elsewhere in Scripture, I have been crucified with Christ, and the life I live, I now live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, rather, those who have been humbled and amazed by God's gracious love, oh, they find strong desires in their soul to live a life pleasing to this one who has loved us and will always love us. I love the prayer of Psalm 90, verse 14, where the psalmist says, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. In the unchanging love of God, in the reality that God will love us forever, there is satisfaction, and there is joy, and there is gladness that confronts temptations to sin and temptations to doubt his care. I remember as an unsaved teenager who was learning all about how to rebel against my parents. I believed uh, that God existed, uh, but he was simply uh, a force in the sky that didn't want me to have fun. I remember uh, probably being about 15 or 16 Uh, leaving home that my parents had forbidden me to go and was on my way to a party and I had the thought, maybe God will kill me on the way to this party uh, because I know he certainly doesn't want to have fun. Well, that thought didn't stop me. And, And I would suggest that if we view God as simply a divine killjoy that Uh, is willing to pounce on the slightest transgression, then we will ignore him, or we may be fearful enough to conform our behavior to what is right, but the heart will remain untouched. We will be suspicious of God. We will be bitter toward God. We'll be paranoid about him. But if we hear the words of his love in Scripture— and understand that God loves us and fights for us and provides for us and justifies us and is committed to us with a love that we can never be separated from, then we can safely trust him as we say no to sin and yes to obeying him in every area. Our hearts experience his love and return to him in love with the desire to please him. So, the reality of God's everlasting love should have profound implications to how we approach each and every day. Each day, it is our privilege through scripture and prayer to remember the gospel and that we are eternally loved by God so that our souls are armed for what lies ahead each day. Listen, we we don't need to strive anxiously for other people's acceptance and applause. Listen, when when no one seems to notice my contribution, (laughs) when my kids are all eye rolls and ingratitude, uh, when those who uh, I love fail to love and appreciate me in ways that I feel like I deserve, 
Well, whenever we experience that, we remember that God himself loves me and will love me forever, and that will never change. And I have an opportunity in those moments to be satisfied by his love, to be patient when others fail to love me the way I think I should be loved, to be content when no one around me acknowledges me. God loves me. The everlasting love of God should arm us to face our temptations, knowing that God is on our side. Uh, Because he loves us, because he lives in us by the Holy Spirit, he is empowering us to overcome those temptations. He is more committed than I am to making me more like Jesus, and so we may rightly lean into his empowering love and fight the good fight of faith, persevere into obedience before him. And when we do fail and sin, which is inevitable, uh, we may rise and look to a loving Father forgiving us and justifying us in Christ. And when we experience persistent pain and suffering, which will be an experience each one of us at some point will go through, maybe you're going through that right now. Listen, even those things are not an expression of his wrath. Even in those things, he is loving you. Though we don't have the answers to the questions we may have about why things are happening to us, we can say this, it cannot be because God doesn't love us. Now, his love has been established at the cross. The cross is the unshakable evidence that having paid the greatest price to save my soul, he will not abandon, he will not forsake. No, he is committed to us in love, no matter what is going on in our lives. Ray Ortland Jr., who I've quoted numerous times from his book, Supernatural Living for Natural People, a helpful resource on Romans 8, says, God wants us to feel loved. If we feel condemned and abandoned, we become vulnerable to the seductions coming at us from all sides. But God wants us to feel loved, not with sentimentality, but with the deep certainty that God Almighty in heaven is not opposed to us, though we deserve it. He is for us us. I pray that God grows within each one of you the deep certainty of his love so that you will not feel condemned or abandoned and so that you will not be vulnerable to the seductions of sin and temptations to doubt his care for you. God will love us forever A simple thing to say, yet nothing is more profound for us to believe and understand. So may your soul be strengthened by God's love this day and every day. May you know God's gracious and amazing love, all undeserved, but definitively and forever yours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Culture Podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can know when new content is uploaded. And please share this podcast with anyone you think might benefit from it. Uh, Tomorrow, my friend, police officer and worship leader Tyler Margison is coming in to record an episode with me. So stay tuned for that conversation with him and also a number of other folks that are in the works for interviews. Uh, Special thanks to Kaluna Labs for the music on this podcast. You can check them out on Bandcamp and Spotify. God bless you, and I'll talk to you soon.